Evening. We're going to start by just brief introductions to our distinguished panel here. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Michael Narr, CEO of Building IQ, uh, Leticia Hill with the Vista Utilities, uh, Teresa Sanders from the major metropolitan area, the, the, one of the them anyway, the Vista Serves, the uh, city of Spokane. Uh, Jim Lucas with Bentley Systems, and last but not least, Steve Winstead with Lighthouse, which some of you may know is either SAIC yeah. or uh, RW Beck or <laughs> a whole string of companies. Patrick but, Engineering. Uh, uh, but they're all good. <laughs> so I'm going to start with Michael here and let each of our panelists just give you two or three words about who they are, what they do, who, who, who signs their paychecks, and, uh, and, and why, they, uh, you know, why they're here. And then um, we'll open it with uh, just a couple of general questions, and then we'll immediately open it up to the floor. So put your thinking caps on and get ready to blast off. So uh, Michael, take it away. Thank you, Mike. I'm not sure about distinguished, so yeah, uh, I thought that was so I thought that was a little unclear. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I need all the help I can get, but uh, you'll be distinguished after. Exactly. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as Mike said, Michael Nark, uh, President CEO of Building IQ. Um, Amongst the members of this panel here is, uh, well, I think I have a little bit unique perspective because I'm essentially only really the, um, the supplier, if you will, of, of technology solutions amongst all of us. Uh, really not necessarily directly to the utility, but to the utility's customers. Um, the utility uses our application to, uh, to drive some behavioral changes, uh, but primarily our target actually uh, are the users, uh, not necessarily the utility. So I'm interested to hear some dialogue around that. And then uh, as we discuss and understand and uh, banter around the word smart and what that really means. I think that will be the, uh, the operative word here today. So I appreciate the opportunity and look forward to having a good discussion. Thank you. So my name is Leticia Hill. I work for this Utilities. And just to provide some context, we are located in Spokane, Washington. That's where our corporate headquarters is. We have five, we serve five states. We have about 680,000 customers, natural gas, electric, uh, fully integrated, all of that jazz. So that just gives you some level sets. We don't have to talk about that later on. My role, I've been with the utility for about 10 years. Currently, I serve as the manager of HR strategic planning. I spent the first 10 years um, working in business and public affairs. I'm kind of a policy wonk. I spent about three years in the Washington State Transportation Commission. Um, really, really love infrastructure and policy and how it impacts our customers. Um, I have a background in um, urban regional planning. And some of the work that we're doing around smart cities really ties in with everything else that uh, we've kind of done up to this point. And so really, really excited to talk about the work that we're doing, excited to hear from you about some of the work that you're doing too and the opportunities that we have to learn from each other. Thank you, good morning. My name is Teresa Sanders. I'm the city administrator for the city of Spokane. And in Spokane, uh, that's a mayoral appointment. The, I'm the chief operating officer reporting to the mayor. So the about 2,000 employees at the city uh, report through our office. We are about a $650 million business, about two thirds of that is on the utility side. We sort of break it up, we call it the liquid and the solid side of the utilities. So we have water, <laughs> wastewater, storm water, um, including operation of the dam, and on the solid side, um, obviously our solid waste, including a waste to energy facility. We have a long and robust relationship with our local utility, which I understand is unique. Uh, so I'm kind of intrigued to understand the difficulties that folks are having, and I have to relate, as I was flying down here yesterday, my seatmate um, asked me why I was coming to Austin, and I explained it to her, and it turned out that her former position was in working for a utility co-op in Alaska, and she said, oh yeah, municipalities are a nightmare. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, I guess it's true, so I'm here to engage uh, in <laughs> That's why I'm here. Um, and I also want to want to get to um, what we think is smart and what smart means. And um, I hope it's going to be around focusing on our customer. And we'll talk more about that, hopefully. My name is Jim Lucas. I'm a solutions director with Global Utilities for Bentley Systems. We provide architecture, engineering, construction, design software all over the world, mostly in a collaborative sense um, for analysis and design and a wide variety of, of, of utility industry, or in industries. Uh, my particular focus is in the utility industry. I used to work for Duke Energy and Entergy, generation, transmission, distribution, so mostly electrical background, uh, but have been around the utility industry for 20 years now or so. Um, this panel, as we were talking this morning, is very interesting. 
Uh, these two are an example of things that you should listen to and do <laughs> as you go forward. Uh, because as they describe their relationship between utility and city, uh, they're doing a lot of things that we should talk about this morning. Uh, we have been involved with utilities all over the world, and we don't see what they do very often. So as you go forward, if you have specific questions, as Mike said, we're going to pick your brain too. We want to know what you want to understand. Uh, we're going to rely on you two ladies to guide us because you're doing work. Yep. Well, good morning. I'm Steve Winstead. Uh, I'm a senior systems architecture with uh, Lidos Incorporated, uh, formerly known as SAIC. Many of you may not even know that company. We're, we're probably one of the best kept secrets in the world for a long time. But predominantly doing high technology engineering consulting business. Predominantly, my background is in terms of uh, systems integration, uh, controls, uh, instrumentation systems. Been all over the electric business from generation through transmission and distribution. Uh, recently involved with a lot of the municipalities and cooperatives. Uh, got a totally different perspective than I had for many years dealing with IOUs and system operators. Uh, so it's been really kind of like like Jim was saying, it's been really interesting getting all the different perspectives. So you're going to hear a little bit of everything around here today. So uh, it's uh, I'm hopefully it's going to be a little fun. Yes, I'm yeah, very good. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. You, you I'm the microphone. You're the, you're the, you're the yeah, mic right, stand. Right, you're the mic stand. <laughs> okay, just to kind of as openers here, uh, we were talking over breakfast this morning about you know the sort of the genesis of this panel and uh, what. Yeah. The, I felt like it was needed, and uh, and hopefully it won't be a one-time thing. I'm hoping this will be a recurring thing so we can kind of stay up to speed on how things are progressing. But uh, just to kind of you know set the foundation for this, I think we've probably all seen the situation, regardless of where you live, whether you live in the city, the country, somewhere in the suburbs, whatever. We've all seen the case of the city, the state, the county, or some local authority comes through either builds a new road or refurbishes an existing road. It's anywhere from days, weeks, or months of traffic types. I know in New Orleans where I live, it's a, just a constant thing. There's always road construction going on. And it seems like every time uh, they finish a road, a couple of days later, along comes a local utility with a backhoe and digs a three-foot trench across the newly paved road. Uh, like I said, I, I, is there anybody in this room that hasn't experienced that? <laughs> I doubt it. Um, you know, it's interesting the things that we just take for granted. We just sort of, you know, when that happens, it's like, oh well, here we go again. Does anybody have a reason why that should happen today? Is there any excuse whatsoever why something could be solved with as simple a solution as simply talking to each other should be happening? There's no excuse for it, but it happens every day. And this is a lot of the reasons because of what we've been saying here is that by and large, and I agree with Jim, you know, around the country, around the world, uh, I also have a research company. We have spent the last 12 and a half years talking to utilities day in and day out, asking them about their automation and IT plans. And what we found is on these topics, when we asked them about, you know, interaction with their local municipality, whatever it happens to be, their service areas, they typically talk through their general counsels. Now, I know in New Orleans, where I live, Entergy is a great utility. We have some of the lowest rates in the country. Uh, our reliability, at least in my personal experience, has been very good. Uh, it's a gigantic utility. They serve five states. But, um, you know, they've been pretty good. And because of the fact that we deal with hurricanes and that type of disruption, uh, you know, disasters, um, we have a, a lot of occasion to see how well they're going to do and how they interact with the city. And one of the things that I've observed is that, unfortunately, when we're in the midst of a disaster, for some reason, the first thing that happens is the gloves come off between the city and the utility. Instead of cooperation, there tends to be a lot of finger pointing. And unfortunately, I think everybody here would agree that that is more the rule than the exception, unfortunately. And that's a paradigm I think we really have to change as we go forward. So to begin with, um, the, the question, the way, the way that, another way this panel got started, in fact, in this key one issue of the magazine, we have an interview with a gentleman named Austin Blackman, who is the, uh, the Chief Energy Environment and Open Spaces Chief for the City of Boston. 
I was at a, uh, a conference <laughs> back in September of last year that uh, one of his uh, associates gave a presentation about the relationship between the city of Boston and their local utilities. <clears throat> and the first thing that struck me was that they were saving $11 million a year in energy costs, which is pretty significant. But even more than that, the thing that struck me while I was sitting there listening to the presentation was, how did you start that dialogue? How did that happen? Who called who? Did somebody bump into the, the CEOs bumped into each other at lunch or something? Or you know, how does that start? So the first question I want to pose to our panel here, and particularly to Leticia and Teresa, is because they've been having this type of interaction between their entities for a long, long time, as it turns out. I found out in the early discussions I had with the communications people at Vista. So how does that happen? How should it happen? How will it happen in the future? So in conversations that Letitia and I have had, we, we are to some degree kind of baffled that um, utilities and their municipalities struggle as much as they do because it's frankly in our DNA uh, to cooperate. I would say the reason that it's been successful and what you might learn from is, first of all, um, we have a, a utility, their culture, really steeped an improvement in our community. They quietly sit back and spin out amazing companies like iTron and Coba and rely on and bring um, amazing wealth into our community uh, in a really broad way. So they are, they are more than just a utility player in our community. So I would say try to be that kind of utility for your community. In terms of connecting to, um, to the city itself, I, I get it. I come from the corporate world, from the tech sector, and I have days where I think I don't belong in government either. Um, in fact, you know, between the regulators and the auditors and the lawyers, if we play our cards right, we never have to make a decision or take an action. I mean, we, 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 could, we could justify it if we really worked at it. Um, but where the opportunity is truly at the leadership level, get your visionary leadership people, your thought leaders in your utility organization with the leadership people at the city. And I would say, Start with your mayor, quite honestly. Understanding what the challenges there are because there's not a lot of continuity and leadership amongst government. Um, compared to utility, there's a ton of turnover. But if you're ever gonna gain ground in developing an ongoing relationship <coughs> with your city, it has to start at the leadership level so that both your leaders at your utility and the leaders at the city are really sending the message that we intend to make this relationship work and it really permeates down through the organization. So I'd say that's the best starting point. Thanks, Teresa. So we are a uh, utility that's been around for 125 years. And when I look at our history, um, I know that we've been involved in the community for 125 years from the beginning. And I think that makes a big difference because I'm not, we don't go to the city and say, hey city, what are you working on? We know what the city's working on because I sat with you at a council meeting or because I was at that chamber breakfast and I heard what your issues are. And then I come up and say, hey Teresa, you know, we're working on that too, maybe we should coordinate. I mean, that's being engaged, being a part, being an intrinsic part of the, ser the communities that we serve helps us serve them better. So I think that's really important. And, and I, wanna, I wanna just touch on the pavement cut piece. I can't, I can't resist <laughs> because years ago, we saw this as a problem and we talked to our cities not just the city of Spokane, but the cities across the county and said, hey guys and gals, let's get together and fix this. So we have a regional pavement cutting policy committee that meets yearly twice and talks about, hey, what are you doing this year? Oh, you're gonna be in there? Okay, let's time that and let's work together. It's, we just pick up the phone or we send an email. Sometimes we text. So I just, it's a lot about communication. Couldn't let that go. Sorry, Mike. Oh, that's that's terrific. Keep <laughs> up the good work. Bring some of those people to New Orleans. <laughs> I think I mean, that type of collaboration we just don't see. I mean, I just don't see that. You know, like a pavement cutting commission. It, it sounds funny, but it solves a real problem. Right? It's, it's all communication. Um, in some respects, I, I I mean, I completely agree with what you're doing. I would back up a little bit further for uh, larger investor owned utilities, you know, introduce five states, Duke is what now, nine states, Excel, eight, ten eight states, eight is you know, you, you have such a huge amount of, of data and activities going wrong for, for larger utilities that I, I think you almost need to back up be, before where you're at 
and get your your own house in order almost to speak like you, you you have to you have to understand what data you have that is useful to other people and you have to be able to communicate it internal to your own organization because if, if your own organization doesn't know what they have and what they can communicate there's there's no possible way you can communicate it to an external organization so so backing up and doing an analysis in your own house of touch points with other utilities or with other munis or other cities, uh, that would be the first step in my mind, particularly for larger utilities. Okay, okay this is where you get to play. Anybody <laughs> want to start? Anybody have a question to start with? Okay, I'm only going to give you a few more minutes to uh, prepare for this, so be thinking. Um, the next thing I think, you know, I asked for questions and topic areas from our panelists before the session began. And the thing that came up with just about everybody as we alluded to earlier is this whole idea of smart, of what does that really mean? Uh, quite frankly, for the magazine, I literally spent four months last year, I've been hearing and reading all about smart cities and smart utilities and everything, and we'd already all been through the, the thing about the smart grid, and what does that really mean? And well, it doesn't mean smart, it means smarter, and you know, all the, all the, uh, uh, intellectual uh, spin on that but uh, so I spent literally four months last year trying to figure out a theme for the magazine that would not use the words smart cities and smart utilities and what I finally came down to was intelligent infrastructure um, that's my takeaway I guess of where I think cities and utilities smart or otherwise meet or should meet and do meet and I think that's also the area where we have the greatest possibility of being able to really do some, some great things, some exciting things, and some things that will save a lot of time, money, and resources. So um, I'd be very interested to hear what you all think about that, about you know, what, uh, what is the definition of a smart city or a smart utility, and it's probably not one definition, but what are your opinions, because I think that's how we're going to arrive at what it really is by getting different viewpoints. So anybody want to volunteer as to what SMART is? Yes, sir. If you would, uh, when you ask the question, just identify yourself, your name, and your company affiliation. So my name is Riyas Muhammad. I work for a company called Keto Systems. We used to be known as Spirit Home, which back then probably suits so more in this audience. <laughs> we are a smart grid connectivity for homes. That, that's our problem. So in our definition of SMART, or my definition Excuse me one second. I'm sorry. Can everybody hear him without a microphone? Or yeah. Everybody's okay because we're coming up. So in my definition of smart is if a node is smart, it's able to communicate its requirements, negotiate, and get what it wants. That's how I define smart. So a smart form, a smart load will be able to negotiate with the utility how much it wants. And then look for, you know, do the decision making. Okay. It's cheaper to do the laundry the night. I do the laundry the night. That's smart form. Uh, I'll throw a little bit of a twist into this because when, when I hear people define smart, I hear them talk about the technology all the time. Uh, your example of making uh, communication between a technology and a smart grid. Uh, in my mind, there are ab uh, abilities to do smart things with data. In, and in many cases, data that we already have, but that we don't leverage. So when I, I think of a smart utility or a smart uh, city, I think of one that takes their available data and applies it in a smart way. And that the smart technology just enables the collection of that data to do more smart things. So what do you think of the interplay between the data versus the technology or the, the application of data versus the technology? And, Yes, sir. Uh, I, oh, so I'm Brian Bass. I'm with the Municipal Electric, so we're the Municipal Electric Utility that I'm going through. Um, and just, just in thinking about it as you guys are talking, it seems to me that SMART is a, a way of understanding yourself, right? It's kind of an organizing principle, the way you might say that green is, mm -hmm. where if you're green, it's like, well, now I know what to tell people about myself, but also tell me some of the things I need to do. So if we call ourselves a smart city, there's a public relations it also gives us some direction that when things like smart grid come along and connected cities uh, products come along, we say, yeah, we're, we're a smart city, so we know who we want. That's, that's, uh, that's a cool point. Mm -hmm. It is. Sir. I'm David Phillips. I work for the University of California at Davis. 
this, and we have the advantage of being the utility. We're, we're essentially both a small city and the utility because we were, we were there first. And um, so we have, we, we're pretty well integrated in that regard. But the, when people say uh, smart these days, they generally mean lots of data. And I, and I would say really what smart should mean is action oriented. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yes. the key is um, we, we're in this race to put more and more sensors and, and meters and data out there. You can do so much with a single data point that nobody's doing. We, we're doing a, a meter disaggregation project where we take a single electric meter that, that is uh, collecting data for a district that has parking, that has traffic lights, that has a lift station. That single meter, when you turn it on with a high frequency resolution and do meter disaggregation, algorithms, you can see so much information there. I can tell when the elevator's working, I can tell when the storm pump is running, when it shouldn't be. That's what we need to focus on for the future is action-oriented data. But have you considered the privacy issues the elevator has? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Anybody else? So if I could weigh in just for a second, sure. Michael, because I think, um, I like what you touched on with intelligent infrastructure, and I think that's that's what we're getting to. Intelligent infrastructure that drives an outcome based on data. And um, But I, what I would add to that is I would add integrated intelligent infrastructure, um, because we're currently thinking of ourselves as municipalities and utilities and other. And if we don't take a horizontal look at this, I mean, we really have to recognize that, that our customer is the same, our business model is the same, our business desires are the same, um, we have we have similar regulatory structures in that they're all very difficult regulatory structures. So we're really very much the same. And at the end of the day, we're pipe pavement and tools. And the way that we take any action or invest any dollar to get multiple benefits in terms of outcome, that to me is what defines integrated intelligent infrastructure. And I think that's where we need to be. Thank you. Lawrence, you have a question? Yeah, Lawrence is also great. So, Kind of a different twist of this. Uh, I know Michael many years and we've debated smart and intelligent and what happened. Lawrence won. He's way more <laughs> intelligent than I am. And then I just want to make a call to his eyes in infrastructure and the era of hybridity because I believe we're going to have dumb and smart, however you call it, infrastructure for decades that I don't want to do. But of late, I've looked at this from a different angle and I, and I think as opposed to just looking at smart and data, I agree with you. I keep asking myself, what is the problem I want to solve? Yeah, thank you. And, and I think before we, because what happens is we get all the data, we start looking for a problem. Right? What I would love to hear from the leaders and other series, you know, if you want to give me your top 10 problems, yeah. and then I ask myself, okay, so how do I solve this problem? Absolutely. Do I need data to solve the problem, or can I solve the problem by thinking differently? Because what's happening now is we're collecting all of this data. And oftentimes we do nothing with it because we haven't really defined the problem space that needs to be done smart. So, yeah. so I, I would like to sort of have a conversation around, so you know, what are your top five problems that are being solved dumb today that I can solve better tomorrow? And if I understand the problem space, it can be addressed every time. Well, you raise a, a great point, Lawrence, as you always do. <laughs> um, and this gets into a discussion we had uh, over breakfast just a short time ago about just the general process about how we do things, and everybody's heard of aging workforce and declining infrastructure, and the aging workforce has huge challenges and problems, potentially for utilities, because utilities are sort of getting punished. Most of the rest of corporate America, uh, you know, the days of going to work for a company and spending your whole career, your whole life there, are pretty much over everywhere except utilities. And now utilities are getting really slammed for losing large chunks of people all at one time because it's the last bastion of places that people spend their entire career, their entire life in one job, not one job, but one company. And that's a good, been a good thing. But now, the advantage I think that we have available is to, I guess saying embrace the, the loss of the veterans is not a good way to put it, but basically, we have a chance, and I think this is what Lawrence was getting at, is a way to rethink the way we do things fundamentally. Not just putting band-aids on things and replacing and repairing the same old things that we've always done because I've been in the automation industry for over 40 years from the very beginning of mini computers and microcomputers and the whole uh, uh, 
rollout of this stuff. And for the most part, the, um, the automation projects that I've seen, and there's been some innovative ones, but by and large, it's been mostly automating existing manual processes. We have to take a different look now, and I think, again, this, feel free to disagree, Lawrence, if you do, but I think what Lawrence is saying is that if we step back a couple of steps and take another look at how we do things and try to figure out if there's a better way to do it, not just continuing the same old, same old, so to speak. So, uh, anybody care to add to that? Let me jump in for a second, and I'll be quiet because I have, I think, a different, I do have a different perspective, you do. Um, which maybe is unique. I'm not sure if it is or not, but uh, yeah. there's this age-old adage out there in the old control world, which is uh, you can't control what you can't see or you can't control what you can't measure. Mm -hmm. And I constantly am amazed at how often to whether there's an opportunity or a value to be you know, driven when you ask the question, you know, are, is energy or energy cost a problem? Um, or an opportunity, and still to this day, how many people have no idea how much they actually spend on energy? And to me, fundamentally, uh, before you talk about smart grid, everybody talked about it here as well, or how you talk about smart grid, that's what needs to be intelligent first and foremost. It says, how much am I actually spending, and how do I spend it? And then there's the opportunity to take action on that. And as a, um, a supplier, vendor, value added provider, whatever, uh, building IQ, I think. Um, has a unique approach or a unique way to do that when we talk about interfacing for utilities is, is that we do find ourselves more often than not being that interface back to the utility um, and presenting how much opportunity may exist in a certain whatever geographical area or inside a certain building um, and, and look for their help to essentially bridge that gap. And that building may be a municipal, a municipal building, it may be a city building, it could be a commercial building, whatever it might be. And I can tell you time and time again how just I guess the word is disappointed. Uh, when we look into the utility space, or the uh, municipal space, or the city government space, how often they have no idea how much they're spending. Um, and from a taxpayer perspective, that's an incredible opportunity for all of us. Um, so having said that, I'll, I'll move on. So if we do an instant poll, right, and we, we go back to Lawrence's question, uh, does everybody believe that's kind of the number one problem you should be trying to solve, is just measuring energy consumption? Like it, it seems to be like if you're going to be putting these smart things and, and whatnot, I mean, is that a consensus or is it not? I, I, I see I, some head shakes. Well, well. I'm sorry, your name and your company. Yeah, I'm Dave Tuller from UT here with electrical engineering. So I do the concert work and as well as geek out on this stuff myself. I have a 17 CT e gauge, so I have two boxes and everything. And part of the value, after the initial on this kind of wears out. It's like I'm buying a boat. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I play a lot in the first season or two, and then it starts sinking out. But it's still useful. But a lot of this is the diagnostics. You know, I've gone through three air conditioning systems in my house, replaced them all three over time. And part of it was the diagnostics. Okay. Like, hey, this looks odd. Let me go look at last year's. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I would say that a lot of the value, <coughs> the efficiency is looking at what is going wrong and monitoring. I have a photovoltaic system, right? And I've been monitoring for the same day of the same year, what's my output? I'm trying to match up good days. And Brewster was showing at uh, UT Energy Week some very interesting information about how a lot of these, not a lot, a number of the PD systems that they've got in the concrete, they've been out for a month and nobody really knows, right? Nobody. right? And so if there'd be a text alert that would say, hey, we're not getting the same as maybe your peers in your neighborhood with a given uh, situation for the day, diagnostic information. Another thing that was a, a colleague uh, in the Weber group, he was talking about the general propensity for air conditioning contractors, maybe in specific to our area, to sort of overpower and give you, say, a two and a half ton versus two ton it may be a little bit that they make a little bit more money. Usually it's a couple hundred dollars of metal, but if you're in the heat of the summer and you want it to come down fast as far as your interior temperature, a little bit bigger unit uh, will help with that. And so it's sort of like, well, do you need a V8? No, you can survive with a four or six, but you know, just in case you need to accelerate to get in. And so there could be a lot of information that helps people right size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. their equipment or understand when they may need to <coughs> be
cost advantage to upgrade. So I think that, and maybe embedded in just saying we want to understand our energy usage, but I think there's a whole set of very useful and informative. So uh, to summarize, I can give you one second. Uh, to, we're, we're giving a list for you. It yeah. might not be the top five, but it's, it's, it's five fine. important we're gonna ones. We're going to give you a couple. There's consumption, them. diagnostics, and right sizing or sizing of equipment, and then I think you were next. So I was going to take some issue with Michael's sure. comments and with the Excuse me, your name, name is Patty Duran, Smart Grid Consumer Collaborative. I know who you are, but <laughs> <laughs> else doesn't. I'm sorry. Um, because I don't want to immediately silo the conversation into building efficiency. There's the Better Buildings Program of DOE and how much buildings are consuming, I view as old news. What I wanted to talk about was um, I wanted to leverage on Lawrence's yeah. question to the panel and actually have the panel, especially um, Leticia and, well, the ladies. <laughs> um, answer that question because I want to say really high level strategic because I think smart cities is integration of information systems and communications technology across sectors. Yeah. So building efficiency, energy, parking, security, um, there's more. Mm -hmm. And how does that sharing of data build livability into the city for its yeah. citizens? That's the level that I want to talk at. So okay, I don't think I can hold to a teaching. Yeah. You know, I feel like I'm at church and I want to say amen. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, so I don't, I, I'm, I'm cautious about saying five because I don't know that we've talked to our customers enough to say these are their five. But what I will say is that the work that we've done, so we did a smart grid pilot project in partnership with lots of people that I'm, in, I'm, I'm not going to mention because I'll forget somebody. Um, but that project was really focused on our circuitry and all the whiz bang fancy things we like to do uh, with our engineers and all those experts. The smart city initiative we're doing in the city of Spokane is much broader. It's located in the, the heart of the university district which has five universities. Uh, it is adjacent to a hospital district. We're building a, in, uh, um, a clinic which will serve the low income area that's also adjacent to that district. Um, we have parking challenges. We have also have, a, we serve a low income population in general the in the city of Spokane. Services. You mentioned emergency, emergency public services, safety. public safety, street lights, all of that. And so I would say yes, cost is important. And when we hear from our customers, they do talk to us about cost and I would be short sighted not to mention that. But also the value of the integration across those sectors and being able to have sensors that talk about health and that talk about safety and that really create an environment that's unique and dynamic um, so that, it, and it's not about the utility per se, but it's really about the citizens being able to interact in a space that really changes their lives without even giving credit to the utility. It's just about being in unique space. Mm -hmm. And I want uh, Teresa to talk about it because I know they're doing a lot of stuff on their site too. So, um, Think, I want to get back to the question about what our, our um, city's biggest issue, which I, I think really gets you to the strategic level of what are we really trying to get after. So the most, the largest challenge that we have as a municipal government is affordability. And I will tell you that the mayor that we have in office today is in office because our utility rates, our, our city utility rates were going up double digits and were intended to go up double digits into the foreseeable future. Uh, ostensibly because we had these massive regulatory environment, um, or regulatory issues that we needed to address. And so people felt it in their pocketbook in a real way. And as, Le as Leticia said, we, work, we live in a community that has, um, has economic challenges. In fact, uh, one of the zip codes in our city is the lowest um, uh, median household income in the state. So we can talk about all sorts of whiz bang fancy <laughs> stuff and tools yeah. that we'd like to do, um, but we really have to focus on affordability for our citizens. And not only should we, um, from a social equity standpoint, but we, we want to because we believe that every dollar they don't spend on, on government or on utility is a dollar that they can spend or invest elsewhere in our community, and that drives economic growth in our community, or at least keeps the dollars at home. The other really critical piece for us, um, because we're government, is accountability. So affordability and accountability, and that's where you really get to what are you measuring? What are you reporting? How are you letting your citizens know that you're delivering value for the dollars that you're getting um, to them and or getting from them? The other piece uh, for us is really the alignment. 
are we, how, what do we do and why do we do it? Are we prioritizing the dollars that are invested every year from our citizens to their top priorities? And um, it's a constant conversation um, for us. I'll tell you, if you, if you want to um, really affect how your citizen think about, or your customer in your case, same person by the way, but if you, <laughs> but if you want to understand how you're impacting them, um, go and see um, what's happened to the growth in your utility rates compared to the growth of median household income in the region that you serve. I absolutely guarantee you the, great, the growth rate of your cost to citizen is higher than the growth rate of their income, almost in every single case. Well, lots of questions. Lots of questions. <laughs> Lake Mendez with Net Impact Austin. From an organizational design aspect, do you all see uh, cross pollination between, say, a utility and a city with the, the human capital so that you know, as the utility begins to kind of lose some of its talent edge, that there is that ability to compensate? So um, I actually think that I'm gonna let, I, I could be in my cog. We all just sit here for an hour and chat about this. Um, so back to this being part of our DNA, I think that, um, that part of the, um, the biggest project that we've done in developing the university district in Spokane began with a VISTA sending a loan executive to the city. Uh, because you know, cities aren't by their nature um, really innovative in the, in the way they think. And so our ability to send resources back and forth or to bring groups of resources together to get after these key issues has been hugely impactful for us. I don't know what the dollar investment is in the university district over the last um, decade, but it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars um, and, and getting close to thousands of, of jobs there, all because we're able to share intelligence across the organization. We were talking about this this morning, and um, Mike mentioned it as well, the, the issue with aging workforce. In my view, it's really a fault of leadership. If you don't have people ready to move up in your organization to be able to grab onto those relationships and continue them. I mean, we, we realize that we've let some of them go because people have moved around, but this whole idea of integrated intelligent infrastructure, um, we have to have in, in, integrated intelligent people uh, working together across the silos uh, to get it done. And, and, and again, we do it pretty well. Can you hear yes, I guess is the answer to your question. <laughs> <bench. laughs> but, yeah. but you have to be up and running. These ladies, they're, they're up and running. Yeah. The things that she said in her answer, uh, ability to share data, somebody that's planning ahead, some relationships that are established at every level between the cities and the companies. These are things that are prerequisites before you get to where you're at, where sure, yeah, somebody at the GIS side of the city goes down for six months with a health issue, somebody from the utility can backfill or at least cover some of their aspects. You can work out an arrangement to help each other, but it's only because you're already familiar with working with each other, right? So you have the perspective of well, we're already up and running, and sure, absolutely, we can do it but a lot of the folks that I work with aren't quite there yet. Yeah, and that's that's the steps, right? You have to get there. Do you have the other microphone? Oh, ah, my. oh okay. here, there it is. We're missing, we're just waiting. this one. Wait. We're keeping it away from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So, um, yes, and I think that Avista's done a lot around this um, for multiple reasons. Uh, when we look at uh, our loaned executive um, effort, the smart, the uh, U district was a concept that was bouncing around and folks wanted to do the work and yes, 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 we need someone to do the work. And we realized that if you really wanted to do that, you had to send somebody in and partner. And actually at that time, I'm trying to remember where I worked, I worked for the city in my other life and I worked for the utility. So I, I, I think, I can't remember who I worked for at that time. I might've worked for both, which is kind of a weird place. Which we need to do more of. Which we should do more of. Yeah. But, um, and so the fact that you send somebody in that un begins to understand and not only do the work of that project, but also start to make relationships across the pool inside of that other organization, that's really, really powerful. Secondly, because I'm in HR now, uh, one, and I'm not sure how many, how many utilities do we have in the room? Okay, so um, in our utility, uh, we recently, probably say two or three years ago, let me say three years ago, we, did a voluntary severance um, package for a lot of folks who were near and dear to my heart uh, that walked out the door. And I remember, 
sitting in my window going, oh my God, we just let like hundreds of years of experience just go um, because we had to. But fortunately, uh, we had made the investment. My boss had been taking me to meetings with her the whole time that I'd been there. She's like, you're coming to this meeting. I'm like, I don't know anything. You're coming to this meeting. And the fact that she chose to do that as a leader set me up to be able to have a lot of those similar relationships that she did, perhaps not to the depth because she'd been there for 30 some odd years, but she made an investment in me. And then um, now I'm in HR, which is very unique, <laughs> um, being a planner and being outside of your comfort zone. And then the company says to you, great work in business and public policy. We want you to come and be in HR for a while. And you say, huh? Um, allowing people to get outside of their boxes, getting outside of their comfort zones, will not just allow, enable you to be able to talk about innovation, but allow innovation to take place. Because we can talk about innovation in our boxes, but until you're outside of your level, then you're like, well, why do we do it that way? Or why have you guys always done this? Because you're asking questions that are fair and may not, they're not brilliant questions, but they uh, allow an opportunity for a pause and sometimes the pause is where you really get the best sparks. So I would encourage utilities and others, share resources. Um, one of the things we, we talked about over breakfast was sometimes you have these techno walks. Uh, I call them techno walks. I'm sure there's a much more formal term for them. But uh, <laughs> whatever. Um, but you have some, you have some fantastic te techno walks, and they're in multiple organizations. They're in the city, they're in the utilities, allow them to work together, but also make sure that they're aligned with the bigger picture. Because we have one organization that was kind of doing GIS. It was a GIS consortium countywide, included the utility. But when you had the retirements take place, a lot of those technowonks walk out the door, and they haven't, because they're technowonks, they're just concerned about the technology. They're not necessarily concerned about the human capital element. So when they leave, there's nobody to take their place. And so we were saying, gosh, we've got to get that group back together. But not just get the group back together, get them integrated into the vision of the smart city. Before we move on, I just want to inject one quick thing here. Get, getting back to the original question, and what does is, what is a smart city, smart utility thing mean? And the takeaway that I'm getting from this, and you know, anybody wants to comment on this, feel free, but is that smart city has to be, first and foremost, more than just a label that it resides in the hierarchy of whether it's a utility or a city. It really has to permeate the entire company, Absolutely. and especially in the case of the city, the citizenry has to feel the, the smartness, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. So um, I like the thinking of it as a almost I like, like that, green. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're right. smart. Yeah, that's a good green, way to put it. I think. It's, it's a I like it a lot. It's as the one jump in the back. <laughs> yeah, that's as far back as it goes. Guy Barbers, I'm from the UK. I just wonder. Um, Your name and company, please. Guy Barbers, uh, SMS. Uh, I wonder who paid uh, for the smart city. Mm. You had to ask that, didn't you? Yeah, it's a good <laughs> question. Anybody want to grab I'll, that? I'll one? take a crack at it. Yeah. So, um, everybody pays and nobody pays is the short answer. But what what we anticipate as we make whatever smart cities integrated investments we make, um, we expect them to pay for themselves. If we can't sell the value proposition on what the investment is, both for the customer and for our organizations, then we're not going to be able to get there. And I'll give you an example of how this has worked for us at the city. Um, the city of Spokane is, according to the EPA, the first city in the US who is, that has delivered an integrated clean water plan on time um, and exceeding regulatory requirements. The reason that we were able to do that is that we integrated all of our, our resources. So this is how we think about what a smart city is. We take our street utility, our water utility, our wastewater utility, anybody that we can combine together, and because we're getting multiple benefits for every dollar, back to the, we tear up a street, we're replacing aging infrastructure underneath, and we're investing in stormwater on street amenities. So for the public who thought, we can't afford swales and trees and bike lanes, they're realizing because I get a wastewater or a stormwater benefit from doing it that I can pay for it and we can pay for it out of current rates. And we did all of that um, while capping our utility rates at, um, at CPI, at inflation. So we have a 20 year model for capping of our utility rates because as you heard, our citizens told us we're tired of your utility rate increases, but it forced us to push back into the model and get more bang for the buck. So not only did we meet a federal regulatory requirement, we're able to invest more 
in our street surface because we've combined the dollars to get it done. Nobody paid anymore, and we got more. And it sounds like magic fairy dust, but it's not. So, so I'll, I'll ask uh, a comment, because I want your opinion on it. Uh, it sounds like an expansion. <laughs> Stere Stereo. Stereo it sounds like an expansion on Lawrence's question in that you solve a problem yes. and you justify the, the solving of the problem through the monetary savings. Exactly. But the next question you asked yourself was what are corollary problems mm -hmm. or other exactly. things that we can look at while we're solving that problem? Yes and you're getting the benefits from that too on your ROI, is that? Yeah, and, and that's exactly right, and I think, um, and that's where the magic fairy dust comes okay. from. So our, our, our it's culture- It's not too microphone, no, it's magic fairy. Our culture is very much, like I said at the beginning, every action and every dollar investment has to have multiple benefits from somewhere. And it was a real tough time for us to ratchet back um, our utility rates from a 16% increase to less than a 3% increase over the next many years, which by the way created a significant hole in our general fund budget because we have a significant utility tax that we've ratcheted up over years because we haven't been able to figure out how to control our operating spending. So it, it had this really interesting cavalcating effect, but what it forced us to do as an organization is to reset the bar and necessity being the mother of invention, we had to go back and figure out how are we going to meet this need and it forced us to completely rethink the model, which you know now when we go out and engage our citizens and say we're gonna do a street project, oh by the way, it also includes a water project and a stormwater project because we're putting a CSO tank over there, and because there's stormwater investment in this street project, we can get your bike lanes and your sidewalks and your trees. So it, it's, it really is reset the bar, figure out what you can do within the new limits, and, and you can get there and, and get a lot more done with the same dollar. And the more we integrate then, so that's us, and we're integrating that thinking across our organization. Our, our citizens are so confident in the outcome that they just approved a street levy without increasing their tax rate mm -hmm. um, at a set rate of 78% voter confidence, which is extraordinary in our and community. We don't vote for stuff. No, so. and a $60 million. And a $60 million dollar park bond. Uh, so people have confidence in what we're doing because we're able to demonstrate the value that they're getting with the dollars that we're spending to them. And that's back to the accountability side of as we do this and as we integrate more across organizations, we know the value that we got just within the city. When we get really smart about integrating across organizations, we're gonna get massive bang for the buck. And it seems to me that that is the definition of the starting point of a smart city. Yeah. So I would, just right. the same I mean, that's, thing yeah. is that they're achieving that has all absolutely this. nothing to do with energy, utility, or anything like that. It has everything to do or with leveraging resources. Or technology. But it could, but it could. It could. It could. Yeah. Well, what a okay. technology piece could to that next step that says as you're going through this and solving these problems, how can I apply the technology to actually get the incremental value piece yes, out of it? Yeah. Yes, it makes me the think fairy dust. We like fairy dust. <laughs> I, I like how we, when we did, when Avista or Washington, we were the same company, Washington Water Power um, created iTron. Uh, but the, we created iTron not because we thought, oh, it would be really cool to have these smart meters and all that kind of thing. We created iTron because we were like, there has got to be an easier way to do this collection of, of you know, from our meters. And so our CEO at that time got together with a couple of guys. They went over to his um, garage. I'm not saying there were beverages. <laughs> <laughs> but they, did, they sat around and said, how do we fix this problem? And then once they fixed the problem, we said, oh, this is a really good idea. Maybe we should create a spinoff, go forth and prosper iTron. That's fantastic, that's solution oriented. Oh, and by the way, it creates some technology that's really cool and it's gonna revolutionize all kinds of different countries. That's fantastic, but you have to start with the problem and that's how we'll get to the cost piece, much like Teresa's been talking about here. Well, you know, one of the things that we see just from a systems integration point of view, and to go back to answer your question specifically and to address the fairy dust, we're seeing more and more, you know, being the consultants out there in the business, more and more pressure about providing an absolutely solid business case yes. in terms of here's you know what the payback's going to be and there's more and more pressure especially with communities and the co-ops that don't have infinite resources that don't have real deep pockets to go out and absolutely i mean a no bull crap here's what it's going to take you're going to get paid back in the three years and then after that you know it's great so those are the kinds of things we're seeing from my perspective in terms of what 
the fairy dust actually comes from is mm -hmm. what's the payback going to be and when am I going to get it? Yep, exactly. So that's a that's a big. My, I know we're we're getting no, close. No, I just it. realized there's a networking break at 9:30, so I'm going to go ahead and take the extra five minutes or whatever it takes. <laughs> Anybody who wants to stay is welcome to stay. Anybody that really has to go potty or something. Well, <laughs> but Lawrence, you want to pick up? What you well, I, this has been fascinating. So, so at least I, I, I've, I've learned a lot. That's why I planned it. <laughs> it's by design. You know, but here's the issue. So, and, 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 and so it's kind of interesting that 20 years ago we walked away from Airbnb resource plan. The, in, the electric industry, we deregulated, everybody was going to get away from this. Now it's smart city, we seem to be coming back to say that the best way to optimize resources is to go back on Airbnb resource plan. And so the, the question I have for teachers and the teacher, even the general who spoke, is for a moment, assume you're not in Spokane, mm -hmm. where everything is seemingly well structured. Yeah. Seemingly well structured. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's expand this discussion to the rest of the country, mm -hmm. where you don't have news, where you don't have this love fest between the city and the you have an IOU, where you have multiple Absolutely. IOUs. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, be in that state and help us to see how would you, based on your experience, how would you advise other states, other communities that don't have the perfect world like Spokane, but the imperfect world like the rest of the country? You know, and this gets to what, one of the things that I wanted to follow up with that we really, you know, I thought the subject of this was all about was what's the relationship between the muni's and co-ops with IOUs, with GNTs, what's the future look like? Because these guys are out there touching the customer. And how is that, you know, the customer being more and more involved, how does that flow back to the big guys? How does that, how does that relationship between you and, and vulnerable power work, you know, the, those kinds of things. So that's really one of the things I really want to hear about. Should we, should we, do you want me to answer that one? Yeah. Yeah, let's just then we'll take another question. Okay. So if we Very were, nice. yeah, I'm like, okay. <laughs> Very <laughs> nice, right. So if we were talking to kind of a, a broader, and, and please know, <laughs> Spokane is not a perfect place. We we get into plenty of disagreements, opportunities so for have the agreement. relationship to do that. Yes, yeah. but um, I would say start small. Just start mm -hmm. small. Uh, sometimes we go in and we want to do something so big. We you know you run. You're like, okay, here's what we want to do. We want to build this transmission line. It's gonna be fantastic. Trust us. We've already run the numbers. Let's go. And they're like, whoa, where is this coming? from? You know, one of, one so, of the questions we had here, a couple of them, was surrounding the, the, the P word, politics. <laughs> and I think your point is well taken, that if you start big, oh. politics is going to oh, be yeah. all oh, over yeah. it. So I mean, mm -hmm. starting small, you get the advantage of mm -hmm. keeping maybe not all the politics out of it, at least of, from everybody jumping on board. I think we had a question up here. So. Yes, my name is uh, Graham Richard, and I'm with the Advanced Energy Economy and the former mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Hey, Lawrence has raised a question that has been paramount with a group of 138 cities that have formed the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. And I've been advising and working with them with our member companies. And that organization is finding that the biggest challenge for innovative companies that are members of uh, our association, like uh, Microsoft, Apple, and General Electric, and Johnson Controls, and Siemens, and others, is trust. Yep. And so the question, Lawrence, that I think you're raising is one which I'd appreciate the panel commenting on. Even though the two of you may have, as you said, um, differences of opinion that lead to opportunity for new projects, there's a high degree of trust in the evidence here. It's true. And from my experience in a city of 250,000, if you cannot build that trust with the vendor community, the private public partnering opportunities, the public the public partnering opportunities don't work. So you come not to technology, but you come to trust. Yes. And so my question, following on Lawrence, your very perceptive question would be, how do you do that? How do you build the trust that uh, allows a building IQ, a LIDOS, to be able to actually have a deal that works for everybody's benefit? So, so we touched on this, I think, uh, in a couple different places. We're kind of backing into the answer of this question. A uh, gentleman in the back had a question about, you know, can you share resources? Well, sure, but you, you have to, you have to, 
you have to have all these things before you can do that. And, and the way that you approach those, I, I think, is, is that you almost treat it like a project. Like you, you would go out and, and implement a GIS system, or you would go out and implement smart meters, or you would implement something. You have to implement a relationship as a project. You have, you have to have a sponsor at a high level that recognizes that it's valid, that's willing to go talk to their counterpart in the city or Muni or IOU that you're wanting to partner with. You, you have to identify, uh, like we said earlier, uh, you have to identify areas within your company where the data is available and valid and can be shared. And you have to identify the touch points almost like you would identify an integration between systems. Because it's really what you're trying to do is to set up an integration between your system and this other system. Uh, so the touch points and approaching it like a project would be kind of my suggestion for approaching it. Well, and you know, I want to no, we're all like, we're, 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 we're talking about trust, and that's one of the one of the key things, you know, that the Lios, formerly SAIC, really banked on. In other words, we didn't do a whole lot of advertising. We didn't go out there and, and just basically put our name out in front of everything. We used word of mouth. In other yep. words, do a good yep. job for one person. Yep, that's it. It right spreads. <laughs> it it's the best advertisement. <laughs> it's the best marketing that you can do. Absolutely. You've got to do that good job. I mean, even if you have to take it in the shorts to get that job done, yep. that customer comes back to you and they go, these guys, all the cities talk and, and mm -hmm. um, all the co-ops do too. And if you don't have that trust, you don't even get in the front door. I mean, forget the marketing stuff. If, if your word of mouth is not out there and people can't go and say, and, and that's what we use all the time, is go back and talk to these guys. Go talk to these guys. And don't listen to us. Listen to them. So is that, that's vendor to? That, that's, that's vendor or, to, to in, anybody. To a muni, to a co-op, to an IOU, to an ISO, whoever. It, that's what it's all about. Okay, good. Thank you for holding that mic for me. <laughs> 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 Can you call on me? Does it feel better to hold one? Thank you for holding my mic. You're losing control this way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you lost control. Losing control? <laughs> as, as Steve pointed out, you're appropriately named, Mike. Mike, exactly. <laughs> so I. I I love the input. I think we um, have all in, enjoyed each other. Absolutely. I think we're going to have a lot of conversation after this. But the, but the idea that you do take it from a project perspective, that you begin with one, one win, one connection, one at a time, which is why it's really difficult to begin a conversation with a group of municipalities or whoever on something like smart cities, yeah. which is this you know, really nebulous thing. I mean, we have that trust relationship. So when Leticia calls and says, can you loan us somebody to participate in smart cities? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, but sure. Um, <laughs> and so we do, and we do, and then we work it out together. But to take on a topic of, of this magnitude with people that you don't have relationships with is obviously really difficult. So you, you start with the small thing and figure out how to build upon it. And at, at the end of the day, look for value for your customer because you both have the same customer. And if you can start, as we say at the city, you know, find common ground and in all cases act with civility. If you begin with that, <laughs> you can probably, you can get a long distance. And I wanna, I think, piggyback on the trust piece because trust has been, it's so um, pervasive. Um, I've never really understood it until I started doing this work. So for example, um, we get calls from our cities, not just the city of Spokane, but our cities will call us and say, hey, Leticia, we just got this vendor that came in have you ever worked with them? Exactly. Do you know anything about them? Will you come meet with us with them? Mm -hmm. And I'll say, I don't know anything about yada yada. Um, they'll say, but that's okay, we trust you. We trust you, so we'd love to just have you in the room. Um, and maybe you could bring an engineer or two, and then we can talk about whether or not we should go with this vendor. Bring your BS meter. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's trust. Yeah. And so, and, and what has been really interesting to me over this conference, um, this, I've never been to the ETS conference, but listening to um, folks talk about how uh, uh, utilities are going away and we don't have a relationship with our customers and all this, I'm like, that's intriguing because I feel like um, our customers, not all of them, right? I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, unicorns and rainbows, but um, just, just fairy dust, fairy dust, fairy dust. little fairy no dust, but not all our customers, but I think a lot of our customers <laughs> trust that, that our intentions are pure 
and that we're going to respect kind of the purpose of what we're called to deliver. I think we're going to have to no, you're off. Leadership is also obviously a very strong requirement to make any of that happen, right? It's, yeah. And that that's easier said than done as well. So we'll, we'll I mean, all just, be around. Yeah. 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 Another yeah. quick comment here to reverse roles and kind of maybe kind of provide an answer. Uh, <laughs> something we would ask because we have several representatives of the supplier community here. I see a, a new and different role that builds on this trust factor for suppliers, whether it's consultants like Lytos or whether it's vendors like Bentley and, uh, and Building IQ, there's an opportunity here, I think, for, and, and you know, a lot of utilities and a lot of cities have already done this, of changing from a, a buyer-seller relationship to more of a partner yep, alliance yep, partner yep, exactly. relationship uh, yep. and doing things together as opposed to through a bid process exclusively. But I, I see a role developing here, uh, we talked about this over breakfast also, Suppliers provide an opportunity to have a, a non-biased clearinghouse for cities and utilities to be able to cooperate on a data and information systems level by using them as sort of a dispassionate third party, so to speak, to be able to play, like, if you're trying to coordinate work management systems, for example, it'd be very awkward to tell the city, turn over all your work management details to the utility, or tell the utility, turn over all of yours to the city. But if you put them in a central clearinghouse type database that's overseen by a consultant or even a vendor that doesn't have any vested interest either way, but allows a way for you to share data back and forth, I think that's a model that I think is worthy of consideration and development. So with that, I want to thank everybody uh, for all thank your you. questions. <laughs> and they did a great job. They actually acted like they like each other. So, anyway, uh, if you like what you saw here, uh, Kelsey Prime News is again next year. Thank you. Thank you.